Our expedition so far had taken us through a variety of landscapes, climates, histories, and cultures. As we neared the midpoint of our journey, it was now time to go north, as far as the road could take us, to the very edge of the map, and find out what new sights and stories awaited us. After spending some time camping on the top of the World Highway, we crossed back over the Yukon River and passed through Dawson City for the second time on this trip, heading for the start of the Dempster Highway a short distance south of town. The Dempster Highway is an all-gravel highway traversing 736 kilometers or 458 miles of Arctic landscape with very limited services at Eagle Plains and Fort McPherson. The road has two ferry river crossings and terminates at the northern town of Inuvik in the Northwest Territories. This is one of the most remote roads in North America and a safe trip requires some planning. It's important to make sure your tires are in good condition and you carry a spare or two. You'll also need to have enough fuel to be able to make it 500 kilometers or about 300 miles. Well, we just turned on to the Dempster Highway which is the highway leading from Dawson City to Inuvik. And this road is like 570 miles long all the way to the town beyond Inuvik called Tuktoyaktuk, which is on the Arctic Ocean. That is our goal. That's where we're heading now. We're super excited. An hour or so down the road, we came to Tombstone Territorial Park. This park is geologically unique and bisects the divide between two watersheds, one flowing to the Beaufort Sea and the other to the Yukon River and out to the Bering Sea. We stopped at the park's interpretive center to explore the exhibits and learn more about the park. It turns out that most of the land we would be traversing is land owned by the First Nations or Native tribes that have called this place home for thousands of years. These tribes roughly are located in the same areas as the massive caribou herds that occupy these lands, as they are a major food source. At the visitor center, we were also given a guidebook that would share information about the Dempster Highway and points of interest from here all the way to Inuvik. Construction on this road was originally started in the 60s to support oil and gas exploration in the area. The road was finally completed in 1979, along with an easement for a pipeline that was never built. The road makes its highest elevation pass in Tombstone Park before descending on a plane and heading for the Blackstone and Ogilvy Mountains. The geography of this road is very unique and sections of the drive wind through the mountains, follow creeks and rivers, or cross long flat plains. We saw wildlife and unique plants that only exist here in the north. At one point, we came upon an area characterized by bright orange rocks on the hillsides and a river that ran red. We learned that this area is highly mineralized. As water percolates through limestone, gypsum, and sulfide-bearing sediments, it dissolves parts of the rock that end up in the water. These waters are high in magnesium, bicarbonates, sulfate, hydrogen sulfide, and chlorine. Further down the road, these mineralized waters combine with the clear Ogilvy River in a dramatic confluence of color. In this area, sheep are common as they come to drink the waters or lick the mineral-rich hillsides to add calcium and magnesium to their diets. We saw sheep everywhere here, including on the road. Driving along the Ogilvy River, we came across a sign that said Elephant Rock. 
Our booklet from the visitor center said that a rock that looked like an elephant could be seen on a distant hillside if the weather was good. We scanned the horizon for a while before we found it, and sure enough, it looks just like an elephant. Further on, the road climbed Seven Mile Hill up to the top of the 200-kilometer wide Eagle Plain, an elevated sandstone plain of gently rolling hills. 370 kilometers into the drive, we came to our first glimpse of human settlement, Eagle Plains. Here you can get fuel or stay the night at the hotel. We stopped in to check out the hotel and look over the pictures on the walls that illustrated the famous sagas of the past from this area, including the Mad Trapper of Rat River and the Lost Patrol. From here, the road winds into the Richardson Mountains. Because we were so far north, the tree line was very low, and even the slightest elevation made it a challenge for trees to take root. As we crested the top of the mountain pass, we were greeted with the Welcome to the Northwest Territory sign. The sign provided lots of information on the Northwest Territories and encouraged visitors to do some hiking off the road if the weather was fair. From the Northwest Territories border, the road begins to descend into the Mackenzie Lowlands, where the mountains and alpine tundra disappeared behind us. Here, the road settled into a lowland of boreal forest spotted with lakes. Because of all the water, here we started to deal with terribly thick mosquitoes and flies, and we were living in our bug-repellent clothing and making quick entrances and exits from the RV to try and keep the bugs out. This area is so low and flat because it is the river valley and the beginning of the Mackenzie River Delta. Two ferry crossings are made in this area. First, the smaller Peel River that utilized a cable ferry, then the mighty Mackenzie River that utilized a large double-ended ferry. Crossing the Mackenzie, we had the opportunity to ride on the ferry's bridge with the captain. I'll use both hands. <laughs> we were traveling the road at the busiest time, and our captain said he was seeing many RVs a day during this midsummer. Yeah, we're doing like five, six hundred people a day. I'm surprised at how many motorcycles there is up here. Probably do 40, 50 RVs a day. He told us of the challenges of operating a ferry on this swift river with constantly changing currents and riverbanks. The Mackenzie Ferry not only services traffic on the Dempster Highway, but also crosses through the town of Segachik that is located just upstream. In between the rivers and 550 kilometers from the start of the road, is the town of Fort McPherson, where we decided to fuel up. Once across the Mackenzie River, the road is another 124 kilometers, or 77 miles, to the town of Inuvik, and is relatively flat, straight, and very dusty when dry. So we just made it here to Inuvik. We are down here at their boat launch. We are on the east channel of the Mackenzie River, basically right on the delta where it flows out into the Arctic Ocean. We made it here just fine. The rig has done great. All is well. We didn't have any tire issues. Let's go check this town out. Upon entering the town, one of the first things we noticed was the silver tubes connected to each house. This turned out to be the sewer system for the town, kept above ground due to the permafrost. We also noticed that all the buildings are built on pilings and elevated above the ground. If there are structures that are built into the ground, cooling systems similar to the ones we saw on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline are used to keep the ground frozen underneath the buildings. 
The town of Inuvik was a planned community constructed by the government of Canada in the 50s to provide a centralized location for government and modern amenities to the native communities of the Northern Northwest Territories. Over the years, the town has been supported by a number of different economies, including defense, petrochemical exploration, police and government, healthcare, education, minor tourism, and going into the future, communications. Inuvik lies far enough north that its location is ideal for ground relay stations for polar orbiting satellites and has many satellite ground stations around the town. A fiber line that was completed in 2017 now provides the town with high-speed data communications for satellite downlinks. Subsequently, this northern community now has blazing fast internet and cell service, which we were not expecting this far north but took full advantage of during our stay. During our time in the town, they happened to be holding the Great Northern Arts Festival, showcasing northern artists and traditional handicrafts. We were able to attend the opening ceremonies, and here we got to witness the Aquavic drummers and dancers perform some of their traditional ceremonial interpretive dances. They opened the art hall, and we enjoyed looking at the art and speaking with the local artists. Another thing we did was visit the Western Arctic Visitor Center that had exhibits on the past and present ways of life in this area of the North. Overall, we found this town very welcoming and quite modern in its amenities. After a few days in town exploring and reprovisioning, we continued north for the final leg of our trip. We just left the Nuvik and we are on our way to Tuck. We're on our way to the Arctic Ocean. In the fall of 2017, the construction of a new road connecting Inuvik to the hamlet of Tuktoyaktuk on the Arctic Ocean was completed. This road is the first all-season road to the Arctic coast in Canada. Prior to this road, summer access was limited to plane and boat traffic, and an ice road was constructed each winter on the Mackenzie River to connect the town. But now, anyone can drive this 138-kilometer or 86-mile road to the top of the continent. The road was generally in good condition, but being so new when we drove it, there were still some very soft and loose gravel sections that the truck sank into. We ran in 4x4 for a while to help add stability to the drive. So when we got to Tuck, the very first thing that we did was we headed right to the end of the road where we found the Arctic Ocean. Well, this is it. We've made it to the end of the road, as far north as you can go here in Canada. And just in case you weren't sure where you were at, they put a big sign to let us know we're at the Arctic Ocean. It's been quite a journey to get here and I had no idea what to expect. I think I envisioned in my head for some weird reason that the end of the road would be a desolate, remote place. But that's not the case at all. We get here and we find a very thriving community. They live a very different life than we do, but this is their normal, this is their home. And it's just really cool to be able to be here for just a short period of time to just get a little glimpse of it. We then went back to the visitor center because there were no parking signs down by the Arctic Ocean sign and kind of started to learn a little bit about where they wanted us to go or not go because when we were there the road was relatively new and the town was still trying to figure out tourism. There are a lot of RVs and people coming and going and that influx of traffic is brand new. The road was only an ice road before and RVs weren't coming up in the winter. At the very end of the road, it's a point of land that kind of sticks out into the ocean. And this is a very communal space. People come and go. It's traditional fishing grounds as well. The boats come and go, they land on the beach, they clean their fish there. There were a few people smoking fish right on the beach. And it, it, they don't want us to be parking in the middle of those areas. And we can totally understand that. I think that being humble to their way of life 
and their space is really essential to traveling to a remote village like this. We did end up purchasing a stay at their brand new campground that they had created right at the end of their spit, right on the Arctic Ocean. And we were able to stay a night right along the water. The sun does not get anywhere near the horizon and we stayed up almost all night because the whole town does as well. The community is very connected with the ocean. They do a lot of fishing. They whale for beluga. They also do a lot of hunting. There is a local caribou herd that is in the area and they go off and they hunt. And a lot of the locals were off hunting or fishing or whaling because summer is the time of plenty and it's the time where they stock up because a lot of their food supply is subsistence. They live off the land still up there. One thing that the fishermen do is they dry or smoke the fish that they bring in so that it lasts a lot longer. And there was a fisherman who was smoking and drying out the fish right on the beach next to where we were camping. And we did purchase a whole dried fish to, to try out. Do most people up here still fish? Yeah, everybody's fishing. Everybody's got a net below their house. So. And do, do most people still Whale too? Yep. I caught one a couple days ago. 14, nine, 14 feet 9. Look yeah. whale. How about hunting? When when did the caribou, when are they around? Uh, they're around now. You can hunt them. Um, us in New Valley, we could hunt them any time of year if it's open season. So this is the peninsula that we hunt caribou on. But there's caribou couple caribou walk through town other day so do you have any bears up here there's i haven't seen a polar bear in five years four or five years there last time a bear came in town polar bear come walk through right through here oh bella's you want that fish? Well, that's good. One thing we were very curious about was how the road is impacting life there. And we talked to quite a few of the locals about their thoughts on the road. And we learned that before the road actually went in, there was a big divide in the community, about 50-50, for and against bringing in an all-season road. Now that the road is in place, we, we asked a few people what they thought of it, and, and in general, the consensus was that it's a good thing, that having the road, being able to access um, Inuvik and be able to get things that they couldn't get before a lot easier, and also bring the tourism in, bring us in to uh, spend some money, spend some time in their community, uh, seemed to be a good thing. And I think. It'll be very interesting to see what this road does into the future, how it impacts their community, and hopefully it brings a positive economic impact without changing their way of life too much. One thing we did while in Tuck is we visited some of the handicraft shops and artists in the local community. They create these really beautiful pieces of art, uh, moccasins, little uh, ook picks, they're, they're little owls made out of the fur from arctic foxes and seals and other animals that they, they hunt for, for food and clothing and these artists get to create these and now sell them so they get to earn a little bit more money from the, the new tourism economy in the town. Getting to talk with these artists and the, the people of the town in general was so, so awesome. They are so warm and, and welcoming, and while most of them preferred to be off camera, it was such an awesome experience and definitely one of the highlights of our time in Tuck. One unique thing that this town has is a Canadian national landmark surrounding a set of pingos that are just outside town. So before we left Fairbanks, we randomly picked up an inflatable paddleboard and this is the first time that we're gonna be using it to go paddle out to see the pingos. 
We joined a few other travelers who had an inflatable kayak, and although our paddleboard was really only designed for one, we made it work with the both of us to get out and see these pingos. So I got the better end of this deal. At least on the way there. This board may be a little small for two people, but we're making it work. <laughs> These uniquely shaped hills that seem to arise out of nowhere on this flat landscape are created due to the permafrost. Pingos typically are formed from a lake or a river that has drained or dried up. Residual water at the bottom of a drained lake heaves upward as it slowly refreezes. The pingo grows until the permafrost and the ice core refreeze solid. These hills can rise to a few hundred feet tall and the two outside tuck are some of the largest in Canada. Tom's turn. Well, we made it. Our maiden paddle in the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> we didn't sink. We're falling. After our paddle adventure, there was one final thing we had to do before leaving. Take a dip in the Arctic Ocean. Well, here we are, about to leave Tuck. We have one item that we need to accomplish yet. We put it off as long as we can. <laughs> But we need to swim in the Arctic Ocean. <laughs> you ready? I'm ready. All right. Let's do this. Oh, okay. it's not warm. Okay, now this is pretty. This is pretty cold. It's cold. All right, quick. Let's get out of here. Oh, it's not getting any deeper. <laughs> How far out do we have to go? <laughs> Are we far enough yet? Ready? One, two, three, go! <laughs> we did it! It's not that bad. Oh, that's the coaching. Okay, look at Mocha. And Mocha's loving it. <laughs> So overall, it was not that bad. I would say that the water was not as cold as Muncho Lake. No, not at all. <laughs> um, it's, you know, 24 seven light and the water's very silty. So I think that it warms it up quite a bit, especially because it's so shallow here. It's really not deep at all. But the getting out and the wind is the worst part. Luckily, we had thought ahead and cranked up the Vario furnace in advance. We also were able to hop in the shower and take advantage of the Aquago's unlimited hot water to get warmed up and clean. Oh, that was the most glorious shower I've had in a long time. And the furnace has a duct that goes right into the bathroom, so the bathroom was nice and toasty warm too. Oh, fabulous. My turn. Making it to Tuck was a milestone in our journey. It's something that we wanted to do from when we first conceived this idea. And I think the real reason we wanted to do it was because the road is new and it's the first time that you could drive all the way to the Arctic Ocean in a camper and actually stay there. Also because there's just some mystery to the end of the road, to as far as you can go, to driving until the road literally runs out in a really remote place. We started our long drive back south from Tuck late at night and enjoyed a fantastic all-night sunset while we drove.
While Tuck and the Arctic Ocean were the climax of our Dempster journey, our adventure was far from over. We had allotted a few weeks for this trip, so we were able to take our time on our drive back south to explore and really enjoy the many other wonders of the Dempster Highway Corridor, as well as get a little work done. While cell service was non-existent for most of the drive, our LiveInLight.net routers, boosters, and data plans enabled us to easily get connected in and around Tuck, Inuvik, and Fort McPherson. This allowed us to extend our adventure on this epic road even longer and pull off the road when the weather turned nasty. When Mother Nature opened up on us in the Richardson Mountains, we saw firsthand the cause of so many of the road hazards that keep the maintenance of this road a constant project. Boondocking spots were plentiful and on our return journey, we found a few of our favorite spots of our entire northern trip that provided many of our fondest memories of the Dempster Highway Drive, like paddleboarding with the dogs on the Ogilvy River and fly fishing for Arctic grayling on the Blackstone River. spots had tight access, and again, we were delighted that the truck camper enabled us to call these extremely remote and beautiful places home for a few days, while still retaining all the comforts of home. As the pinnacle and centerpiece of our northern travels so far, we exited the Dempster Highway after nearly three weeks of touring, feeling exuberant and humbled by the experience. Well, we are back at the end of our Dempster Highway trip, back at the junction with the Klondike Highway, and what an adventure it has been. You can see the rig is a little dirty. Hopefully we'll get it cleaned up soon. Amazingly, we haven't gotten any dust inside. It has been dust free, which is awesome. We did get a little bit of dust in the storage compartments in the back and the battery bay, but otherwise everything seems to be working great. The batteries and inverter are still working awesome. The Trumo retrofits, no problems there. We think a lot of that is due to the uh, Hellwig Bigwig airbags that have really softened the ride. The ride with the truck camper on the truck is actually really quite comfortable, even though we've been on over 2,000 miles now of rough dirt roads. In general, this road is something that we think most vehicles could make it down. We've seen vehicles of all types, from motorcycles, sedans, all the way up to Class A motorhomes and trucks, but definitely the most prominent RV on this road has been a truck camper. That said, it is a really long ride on gravel. It's definitely gonna beat your vehicle up a bit. Our tires are definitely showing the wear. We've seen a lot of people with flat tires on this road. Luckily, we haven't had any issues. Haven't even seen any air leaks in our tires. We did top them off when we were up in Anubik, but they're holding up just fine. We've really enjoyed our trip here on the Dempster Highway. Making it all the way to the Arctic Ocean on this highway was just awesome. And we've really, really enjoyed this drive. The more we travel, the more we see, the more we experience, and the more we learn. Our world expands with each new road in town, and with every new destination, we discover that another lies just beyond. The adventure doesn't end at the end of the road.